Order, order. Kerry McCarthy, please, to move the motion. To see you in the chair. And um, it's a pleasure to be introducing the second petition um, in my time on, uh, as a member of the Petitions Committee. And this End the Cage petition, which was led by Compassion in World Farming and backed by a dozen other animal welfare NGOs, is another one that was held over from the last Parliament. It closed at the beginning of September last year with one, uh, 107,187 signatures. And I do remember it was actually listed for debate, and then suddenly there was yet another Brexit petition that meant that it couldn't be listed. I remember the then minister at the time, who's now in the Lords, was very disappointed because he was actually very keen to see some action on this. Um, so here we are, um, better late than never. The petition starts by stating that across the UK, millions of farmed animals are still kept in cages and unable to express their natural behaviours, and that partly links into the debate that we've just had on animal sentience. Um, the petitioners call on the UK government to end this inhumane practice by banning all cages for farmed animals. And this would entail bringing forward legislation that amends the welfare of farmed animals England regulations 2007 and to phase out the use of sows in farrowing crates, individual calf pens, barren and enriched cages for farmed animals including laying hens, rabbits, pullets, broiler be breeders, layer breeders, quail, pheasants, partridge and guinea fowl. And the um, petitions committee does try to do outreach on, on some of these petitions and they reached out to farmers ahead of the debate by posting something on the farming forum. There wasn't an overwhelming response, but I think um, everybody has um, other things on their mind at the moment. But um, I just did want to say that in terms of the responses that came in, uh, the points were made that animal welfare is of paramount importance to farmers. It is in farmers' interest to treat livestock well, and someone said it is a small minority of farmers that mistreat their animals. And um, I think it's important to get on the record that this debate is not anti-farmers, it's um, just trying to ensure that partly that current standards are adhered to, um, but also that we can do better and we know that other countries have done better and we always ought to be looking at how we can um, move animal welfare forward, not backwards. There has been some welcome progress at European level over the years. There's been EU-wide bans on veal crates, barren battery cages for laying hens, and a partial sow stall ban. Actually, sow stalls, as I'm sure the minister would tell us if um, I wasn't about to say it, they have been banned altogether in the UK, showing that being in the EU didn't stop us going further when we wanted to, although it's often used as an excuse. And, of course, there's the recognition of animals as sentient beings in EU law under the Lisbon Treaty that we've already discussed today. But cages continue to be used on British farms, despite well-established alternatives which allow animals to express their individual needs and which have also been proven to be economically viable. If the UK wishes to maintain and enhance its status as a, as a global leader in farm animal welfare as we leave the EU, we ought to be following the lead of those European countries which have already banned cage systems. End the Cage Age campaigners found the government's written response, published when the petition reached 10,000 signatures, so quite some time ago, hugely disappointing. And I hope we're going to hear more from the Minister today than just a repetition of what was in that response. Our officials are looking slightly saddened by that. I don't know if one of them actually wrote it, but um, I'm sorry if that was the case, but we would like to uh, get a little bit more of an encouraging response today. Um, the government suggested the main determinant, in, this is in the response when it got to 10,000, the government suggested the main determining factor in protecting animal welfare was good stockmanship and the correct application of husbandry standards. But cage systems that prevent so many essential natural behaviours mean that welfare will inevitably be very poor, no matter how good the stockmanship is. A sow confined in a crate in which she cannot even turn around will be suffering because she is not able to exhibit natural behaviours, even with the best care um, and the best stockmanship. The government goes on to say in its response that cages have already been banned where there is clear scientific evidence that they are detrimental to animal health and welfare. But there is a wealth of robust scientific evidence demonstrating that enriched cages for laying hens and farrowing crates for sows are highly detrimental to welfare, yet they remain in use for millions of animals. 
the government explains again, I'm still working my way through the response, that enriched cages provide more space for the birds to move around and nest boxes, litter, perches and claw shortening devices which allow the birds to carry out a greater, greater range of natural behaviours. And I don't think anyone's arguing that enriched cages might not be better than an alternative, but that does not mean to say that they, that they meet animals' needs. The reality is that hens confined in enriched cages still only have just a little more space than an A4 sheet of paper per pen. These cages severely restrict many natural behaviours, including wing flapping, running, perching at a reasonable height above the ground, dust bathing and foraging. Germany, Austria and Luxembourg have banned or are in the process of banning enriched cages. And my argument would be that the UK should not lag behind, not least of all as the main supermarkets have already either stopped selling eggs from caged hens or committed to do so by 2025. And we could make the argument, well, that's down to consumer choice then, if people have the, um, are able to buy um, uh, eggs that are produced to the welfare standards that they want to see, then what's the problem? But we know that there are still some people, actually when the eggs started being stamped with method of production, it did make a, a big change to um, buying um, patterns and that's why some of us are very keen to see method of production um, on other, other forms of um, produce. But there are still many people that would not be able, either because of price or because of availability or just simply it's, it's not on their radar, would not be making that choice. It's also when eggs end up in products so you wouldn't necessarily know the method of production for those. So just relying on consumers to take the lead is not the answer. On sows, the government boasts that the UK is ahead of most other EU pig producing countries in terms of non-confinement farrowing, with a ratio of around something like 60% well, of sows in crates um, to give birth and the remaining 40% housed, housed outside and free farrowed, i.e. crate free. Research is, the government says, ongoing to develop and test indoor free farrowing systems under commercial conditions which protect the welfare of the sow as well as her piglets. But again, the reality is that several indoor free farrowing systems that give the sow freedom of movement while protecting piglets are already commercially available and in use in a number of countries, including the UK. So I'm not quite sure what this research is that the government's talking about. Indeed, systems designed and produced in Britain are being used in the UK, USA and Canada. Sweden, Norway and Switzerland have already legislated to ban the routine use of farrowing crates. Again, Britain should not lag behind the leaders in recognising the science and ending unnecessary suffering. On calf pens, the government points out that the UK unilaterally banned the keeping of calves in veal crates in 1990, 16 years before the rest of the EU. However, as young calves are highly susceptible to disease up to eight weeks of age, they are permitted to be kept in individual hutches of a specified size with bedding provided as long as they have visual and tactile contact with other calves. The um, organisations that um, support the End the Cage Age petition would argue that the reality is that group housing from birth can provide health and welfare benefits for calves, provided groups are small, stable, and that housing provides sufficient space and ventilation and is hygienic and well managed. Cattle are social animals, and much evidence shows that calves are much more stressed and fearful when housed individually, preferring to be housed with other calves. On layer and broiler breeders, the government says that in the UK, the use of cages to house both layer breeders and broiler, that, that's meat chicken um, breeders, is prohibited under the UK's farm assurance scheme standards. But it's actually not compulsory to sign up to a farm assurance scheme. Outside of those farm assurance schemes, cages for layer breeders and broiler breeders are not prohibited. And on game birds, um, which is the, the final example I will give, about 50 million game birds are purpose-bred to be shot each year. The vast majority of those are pheasants. Around a third are actually shot, and about 3 million make it into the food chain. But I think that is a, a debate for another day. And in fact, I think there's, um, there's, well, there's a debate on driven grouse shooting. I don't think it covers um, pheasants and partridges that we may just get round to before the Easter recess. Um, again, the Petitions Committee debate. Um, but for the purpose of, of this debate, I, I won't get into the ethics of that. 
Breeding birds used to produce the birds who will be shot are often confined to raised metal cages placed outdoors for the whole of their productive lives. It is true that statutory welfare codes for game birds state that barren raised cages for breeding pheasants and small barren cages for breeding partridges should not be used. But this is only, as I understand it, a recommendation. It's not legally binded and it does nothing to discourage the use of such cages. Even Basque called for an outright ban back in 2010, stating that the available space in such cages is so limited that the welfare of the birds is seriously compromised and the system does not conform, whether enriched or not, to the five freedoms which are the basis of the UK's welfare law. In 2009, DEFRA initiated a major study costing more than £420,000 into whether the cages could meet the welfare needs of game birds used for breeding. The report was not published until July 2015, and it's funny how sometimes when you're looking back at these issues, it's suddenly I'd completely forgotten how many written questions and how much we'd done to try to sort of chase the government or where on earth this report, which of, of course um, the study was commissioned by a Labour government, and then when we got into coalition, it really just seemed to disappear entirely. And um, as I said, it took until July 2015 for the report to be published. But it was pretty disappointing in that it didn't examine the issue of whether cages could be justified. It just compared cages of different sizes and with different types of enrichment. Um, before I conclude, Mr Davis, I want to briefly mention the Agriculture Bill, which is currently awaiting a date for a report stage in the House of Commons. Clause 1 of that bill sets out a new system of farming subsidies seeking to ensure that public money is used to deliver public goods, and that would include improving animal welfare. And the bill is silent, really, on, on what would constitute better animal welfare or exactly what farmers would be rewarded for, although I think we've made it clear during the bill committee that farmers shouldn't be rewarded just for meeting current legal standards. Um, they should be rewarded for going above that, but then the question is how far above that um, is worthy of reward. Um, many of us are keen to see that it's those farmers who are willing to go substantially beyond the legal minimum requirements a normal good practice, um, not just on preventing animals from suffering, but also in giving them positive experiences that should be rewarded under those financial incentives, under the, the new um, subsidies. To ensure that financial assistance is supporting genuinely higher levels of animal welfare, the bill should provide that payments may only be made in respect of farms that enable animals to engage in their natural behaviours as identified by scientific research. Farmers operating cage systems should not receive any support under animal welfare payments. So to conclude, if the UK truly wishes to be the global leader in animal welfare, we do need to take steps to end the cage age for the more than six million animals that find themselves confined each year. Several countries across the UK EU have already prohibited certain cages that we still allow in the UK. The UK needs to set an example and take an ambitious approach to increasing the number of animals farmed to higher animal welfare standards if it is not to be left behind. The voice is given out. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, the question is that this House has considered e petition 243448 relating to the caging of farm animals. I'd like to now invite Stephen Bonner. Uh, to give us a contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship. I was very keen to take part in this debate, and given that it has been brought here today from a public petition, we are, of course, partaking in democracy in action, and I was very keen to come along. I'm also delighted to take part in the discussion to ensure that I represent many of my constituents from Coatbridge, Chrysler and Bells Hill, who signed not only this petition, but the previous the uh, petition discussed today as well. Animal welfare is an area which takes extreme seriousness uh, in Scotland and by the Scottish Government. The SNP has been very vocal in addressing concerns over the caging of animals and is presently taking steps to strengthen animal welfare legislation through our Parliament. Indeed, a consultation seeking views on proposals to strengthen the enforcement of animal welfare legislation by increasing maximum available penalties 
and the use of fixed penalty notices took place in Scotland and has guided the Animal and Wildlife Penalties and Protection Powers Scotland Bill, which had its stage one debate in the Scottish Parliament just last week of March 12. The Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act of 2006 makes it an offence to cause any animal unnecessary suffering. And of course, recently MEPs voted in Strasbourg to demand a new law to protect animals and called on national governments right across Europe to roll back on intensive battery farms for rabbits and to financially reward farmers who use pens instead of cages. The vote also called for the European Commission to come forward with housing guidelines for rabbits and other animals and to ensure that import, imported animals enjoy the same welfare rights and the same food criteria as their domestically reared counterparts. The SNP Scottish Government invests £20 million a year in supporting animal health and welfare and employ highly skilled and qualified workforces across Scotland, led by our Chief Veterinary Officer Sheila Voss. The Government in Scotland has recently introduced an animal welfare bill which sends a clear message that animal cruelty and wildlife crimes will not be tolerated in Scotland or indeed hopefully across the United Kingdom. So if the UK does lead the world, it's comforting as a Scotsman to know that once again Scotland is leading the UK. And of course that's not for the first time and not in this particular area only. This Act is a far-reaching Act, rightly so. It is a punitive Act. Again, rightly so. If you are found to be causing unnecessary suffering to any animal, whether it be a pet, livestock, or, say, in uh, the practice of uh, animal fighting, um, this will result in an up to a five-year custodial sentence and the potential for an unlimited fine. And this will go some way to combating those who make money from these inhumane and barbaric practices. If the UK does need a precursor, then it needs look no further than Edinburgh and to the Scottish Parliament. The Bill delivers on Scottish Government commitment to creating new legislation to further protect animals and our wildlife. We ensure that welfare needs of animals are met by placing a duty of care on the people who are responsible for their upkeep and their maintenance. The welfare of all our protected animals is provided under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act of 2006. This Act places a duty of care on pet owners and other responsible, others, sorry, responsible for animals to ensure that the welfare needs of that animal is constantly met. The Scottish Government will produce supplementary information in the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act guidance and do that updated regularly. The programme for Government of 1920 commits to increasing the penalties set out in the 2006 Act for causing unnecessary suffering and, of course, will result in a five-year uh, imprisonment and an unlimited fine, as previously mentioned. We know fine well that this is an area that many people across the United Kingdom have serious concerns. The sheer numbers signing both petitions um, uh, illustrates that perfectly. The direction of travel in a post-Brexit set of nations is key in how we implement uh, further legislation. And the UK is watching. And if the UK does truly wish to be world leaders, then they must enact these changes, accept that they need to be made, uh, and also show a desire to implement the findings and uh, implement the changes that are required. And I agree with my, my honourable friend there as well, who brought this petition. Um, if we are um, needing, um, if we are going to um, have cages and pens, I think we should be um, making sure that the, that the monies are going to the right people who are enacting the, the policies that we want to see across the uh, United Kingdom. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Um, now may I invite David Amis to give his contribution. The Honourable Member for Bristol East on leading the debate on this second petition and um, certainly in the detail of her speech I commend her for her words and agree with her completely. Um, science has shown that animals have the capacity to feel and have emotions as was made clear in the previous debate and it's absolutely vital that the UK government uh, recognises this. Uh, I wish um, Mr Davis to pay tribute to compassion in world farming. Uh, the day before we left the European Union I was in Brussels and I went to the compassion in world farming headquarters there and uh, 
discussed a number of issues with them, and I think they do an absolutely first-class job. And indeed, at last week's dinner, which the Honourable Member for Bristol East hosted, uh, I was very impressed with the um, Chief Executive, who explained to me how the organisation started, and it was as a result of farmers. So when the Honourable Member for Bristol East said, farmers do love animals, she's absolutely right. Many of them are what you could describe as uh, big softies. So I don't think it is the House's intention today to bully in them. Uh, great progress has been made, but of course, as ever, I want them to go a little bit further. Uh, there is huge support um, in terms of this issue, and without putting too much pressure on uh, my honourable friend, the Minister, uh, the aspirations of over 100,000 people uh, will or will not be met uh, in terms of how she responds to this debate. Um, I, like so many other colleagues, are appalled by the cruel conditions in which millions of farmed animals across and throughout the world are kept in cramped and restrictive cages, preventing them from performing their natural behaviours and causing extreme frustration and suffering. Uh, pigs, hens, game birds are kept in cages which confine and restrict their movements. The Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation figures show that there are currently half a million um, sows in the UK and 50% of these are caged. Sows are placed in farrowing crates to limit, as has already been said, their movements when giving birth and in the following weeks. The metal frame means they cannot turn around and can scarcely move backwards or forwards. These crates uh, have already been banned in Sweden, Norway and Switzerland and we now must implement these here. It is unacceptable that animals should have to endure these horrendous conditions. Uh, the um, Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation has called for a ban on farrowing crates um, and the uh, farrowing crate use is allowed and used routinely in the rest of the EU, other than the countries that I've already uh, mentioned. But there are commercially available free farrowing systems, uh, 360 degrees, pig safe, and swap systems. These are all acceptable alternatives. And the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation calls for a ban on farrowing crates, which severely restrict the sow's movement and her strong instinct to build a nest before giving birth. I don't know how many uh, people uh, or how many colleagues recognise that a pig does actually try and build a nest be be before giving birth. The farrowing crate is a small metal cage in which pregnant sows are imprisoned for weeks on end, usually from a week before giving birth until their piglets are weaned three to four weeks later. Uh, the sow will be subjected to this roughly twice a year. I mean, twice a year. The metal frame of the crate is just centimetres bigger than the sow's body and severely restricts her movements. Uh, she is completely unable to turn around, can scarcely take a step forward or backwards and frequently rubs against the bars when standing up and lying down. Besides, her cage is a creep area for her piglets. The flooring is hard concrete and some form of heating, either mats or more commonly heat lamps, is used as a substitute for the warmth of their mother's body. And that just really isn't acceptable. I mean, if parliamentarians could imagine being imprisoned in a metal crate for weeks on end and unable to feel the sun, feel a blade of grass or be able to turn round, it's cruel beyond um, belief that is why I support compassion in world farming. The other issue that um, the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation feels very strongly about is that of um, caged, um, 
cages for egg-laying birds. My wife insists that when we or I go shopping, we purchase free-range eggs. Uh, caging egg-laying birds causes immense suffering. Cages confine and restrict uh, the hen's movement. They prohibit many of an animal's natural instincts, and they are a grim reflection on our society. Despite the obvious failings of these miserable cage systems, around 16 million farm animals are trapped in cages every year in the United Kingdom, and we need a kinder future for these animals. And as someone who has kept in an urban area uh, chickens in, in, in reasonably large numbers, I don't know if the neighbours were always pleased about it, uh, I, I, I think you can become very, very fond of your uh, hen. And the idea that uh, I could um, wring a chicken's neck, it just, just wouldn't happen. And uh, I, I think they are wonderful animals. And uh, I do hope that we can persuade uh, the farming community to stop um, keeping them in, in a cruel manner, or a, a small minority of, of them. Luxembourg has already banned the use of enriched cages. I know it's only a small country. Uh, and Austria and Germany are beginning to phase them out. So in conclusion, Mr Davis, in response to a petition on this issue last year, in fact, I think I was chair of proceedings uh, then. Um, and, of course, the minister, as the honourable member for Bristol East has already said, uh, is now in the uh, uh, other place. Uh, the government highlighted that cage um, bans have already been introduced where there is a clear evidence that they are detrimental to the welfare of uh, animals. Science shows us that the caging of animals is cruel and in, inhumane. So, Mr Davies, I'm asking the Minister to reply positively and uh, to tell us that over a period these outdated practices will be banned. Thank you very much. I'm glad you keep eggs and buy, keep hens and buy free range eggs. Very good. And my, now my invite on behalf of the SNP, um, Patricia Gibson. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, and I very happy to speak in this debate, although there is a sense of deja vu, because now that we've established and agreed that um, animals are sentient beings, it by definition means that we should, we should be quite repulsed by the idea, perhaps, of keeping them in cages, um, when certainly that probably isn't necessary under any circumstances that I can think of. Um, but I want to, once again, in the spirit of deja vu, thank the Honourable Lady from um, Bristol East for the excellent opening to the debate that she has given to us and nothing, nothing captures the imagination or the attention um, or the strong feeling of our constituents than the issue of animal welfare and it doesn't really matter um, what the aspect of animal welfare is. I get more and I'm sure I'm the same as every other MP in this regard, I get more emails about animal welfare than I do about any other issue. Um, that has ever presented itself in the five years since I've been an MP, and quite a number of important issues have presented themselves, but nothing has excited my constituents to, to, to email me more than the issue of animal welfare. And this petition has, has, has garnered 106,000 signatures um, calling for the prohibition of the use of caging of animals. And ultimately, that is an animal welfare issue, because we all want to see the highest possible standards of animal welfare that can possibly be achieved and delivered for our furry friends. Um, the Minister, of course, as I've, as I've already said to her, again, it's like deja vu, but I've already said to her that um, she is well aware that in the wake of Brexit there are many concerns, there are many people who are concerned about what this will mean for animal welfare in the UK. Um, we know that members of the SNP in the, Scottish, in the European Parliament backed the end, the end the Cage Age campaign. And we know that the EU Parliament voted to demand a new law to protect animals, calling on national governments to roll back on intensive battery farms and to financially reward farmers who use pens instead of cages. And we've heard much about that today. And we know that the EU Commission was 
asked by MEPs to come forward with housing guidelines to ensure that imported animals enjoy the same welfare and food safety criteria as their domestically reared counterparts, as the Honourable Member for Coatbridge, Chryson and Bells Hill indicated to us. The bottom line is that it should never be acceptable to cause any animal unnecessary suffering. And I think that's, again, something upon which we can all agree. Because there's never a good reason to cause any animal unnecessary suffering. And that's why the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act of 2006 made this an offence. In addition, a consultation seeking views and proposals to strengthen the enforcement of animal welfare legislation by increasing the maximum available penalties, something, as I've already said, I called for since I was first elected in 2015. And it's brought forward also the use of fixed penalty notices. Um, and that was debated at stage one in the Scottish Parliament only last week. And this legislation was referred to by Christine Campbell, Chief Executive of the Scottish SPCA, as exciting changes which have the potential to be trans transformational for animals across the country. Importantly in this bill, the processes for making permanent arrangements for animals to be taken into possession to protect their welfare will be speeded up and will not require a court order. But cages for animals feels instinctively wrong to me and it will feel instinctively wrong to so many people. To keep animals confined goes quite against their natural instincts and it seems quite evidentially cruel. Around 16 million animals are confined in cages every year in the UK. And even for those owners who believe they are doing so with no real detrimental impact on the animals themselves, and many will feel that they are not harming their animals, I am sure. This is a practice with which many of us are not and should not be comfortable. How many of us have seen pictures of these huge colonies of hen farms and not instinctively recoiled? I know I have. And whilst these animals may be well fed and they may be well kept clean, it cannot make for a happy hen. How could it? And as can happen, it seems that what perhaps may be the real driver here is the attitudes and values of consumers. If government won't drive change, then they will. For example, Morrison's supermarket broke cover a couple of weeks ago and became the first major supermarket to sell only free-range eggs. Now, Morrison's is a commercial enterprise. It exists to make a profit. So the importance of this move cannot be underestimated, especially since this was a supermarket, as so many others still are, which was formerly perfectly content to stock battery-laid eggs. Supermarkets make such changes perhaps only based on what matters to their customers. And certainly, this puts some pressure on other supermarkets to follow suit, which in turn puts pressures on egg producers. So ultimately, what producers want, they will in the end get by driving change through exercising their choice. Currently, for example, 60% of all eggs laid and bought, 60% of all eggs laid and bought in Scotland are free range. Given that consumers are becoming increasingly discerning about what they eat and the process of how it gets to their plate and how it is sourced, there is every reason to believe that this figure will rise. Morrison's is simply responding to that, and well done to them for doing so, for meeting their goal to stop selling eggs from caged hens five years before their target of 2025. Now, I heard what the Honourable Member for Bristol East said about waiting for consumers to drive change is simply not good enough on its own. And, and I would agree with that. It cannot, be about, it cannot be only about what consumers do, but the carrot and stick together are important tools. And I think, actually, maybe a year ago, there was a debate in this chamber about microbeads. And I remember saying at that point that the real driver of the change of removing microbeads from products, the real driver of that was consumer concern. The use of plastics, for example, um, the move away from that by, by retailers is based probably almost entirely on, on what consumers are complaining about and what they want. And therefore, the industry is in the process of following what consumers want, although admittedly slower than perhaps we would like. And I think of the, the chain McDonald's, which, because of concerns of consumers, 
did away completely with the use of plastic straws. McDonald's delivered what their consumers want. And I, I think of that big company like Adidas. Now, these are companies that you wouldn't normally associate with um, perhaps driving environmental change. But at the end of the day, they exist to make money and they will do what their customers want. And I think of the example of Adidas, which, because of concerns, consumer concerns about climate, it now creates running shoes made entirely from ocean waste. So these are small steps from huge companies, but the consumer is king, and if the consumer exercises the power that they have, they can drive really quite important and innovative change. But at the base of all this is the need to ensure that all living creatures, if we go back to the debate, all living creatures who have no voice of their own are given the best care, the most compassionate consideration we can afford them. And that's why I'm pleased that the SNP Scottish Government invests £20 million annually in supporting animal health and welfare and employing a high-skilled and qualified workforce led by Scotland's Chief Veterinary Officer. This petition, I think, is timely and it's a bit of a wake-up call because increasingly, as a society, we are becoming more concerned about the food we eat, the creatures around us, which can often be open to exploitation but which have no voice. We are concerned for our environment and we have a newfound respect for the natural world as it becomes increasingly under threat. We can choose to listen to those concerns of our constituents and work with them towards the ultimate goal of ending practices such as caging animals. Or we can be dragged along by our constituents who as consumers will exercise the power they have to effect change. Being dragged along is never an easy prospect. It's always best to work with our constituents, with the farming and livestock industry, seeking ways to improve the quality of lives for our animals. We want our animals to be not just healthy, but happy too. So I'm hoping that the Minister will tell us what she thinks we can do better and more of to try to ensure both happiness and health of our animals. Thank you. And now may I invite on behalf of the Labour Party our own spring chicken, Daniel Zauchner. This <laughs> 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 is always a pleasure to serve with you in the chair and I'd like to start by, I'm not going to cluck, I would start to thank um, my honourable friend, the member for Bristol East, for speaking so eloquently to this petition. She brings her, her expertise and her tireless work campaigning to improve animal welfare. She made an excellent and thoughtful contribution as always um, and I will be echoing um, many of her comments. Now I fear our numbers are, are slightly reduced today because members uh, understandably um, in, the, in the main chamber for a very important statement. But we did have some, some very good contributions. Uh, the, member, the Honourable Member Copebridge, Chaston and Bells Hill uh, pointed out that um, the devolved administrations, of course, will always move ahead of Conservative governments in Westminster. But not all Conservatives, of course, are culpable. And um, the Honourable Member of South End West um, delivered a very, very powerful speech. Um, I absolutely associate myself with his um, comments about compassion in world farming and his account of the suffering um, endured by animals in, in farrowing crates, I think, um, should concentrate our minds. But it is, Mr Davis, the case that we have seen improvements over the past few decades. Um, some of the very cruel and restrictive caging systems um, have been improved. And, of course, part of that was done when we were members of the European Union. And of course, we played a leading role, not just in securing our own improved standards, but, of course, we, we led and we persuaded others right across the continent. And that's worth remembering because we helped to end the use of barren battery cages for egg-laying hens, veal cages for calves, and sow stalls for pigs. And all of those things were, of course, achieved because we were part of that, that bigger grouping, a role, of course, which we have now sadly cast aside. But I do think it's important to pay testament to the, the very progressive thinking right across our country, which means we have often been ahead of those in other countries um, with those bans. But I'm sad to say, every year in the UK, we do still keep around 16 million farmed animals in cages and extreme close confinement systems, when we are well aware, as we've heard, of the significant detrimental impacts on animal welfare, and we do think there are viable alternatives av available. And starting with um, the majority of farmed animals in cages, of course, egg-laying hens, kept in the so-called enriched colony cages that replaced the barren battery cages banned by the European Union in 2012. And they are, of course, an improvement, but the reality is 
that the space is still too, still too restrictive for birds to properly express many of their natural behaviours, such as wing flapping, dust bathing and pecking and scratching. And regulations stipulate that the cages must still must only provide the birds with 750 centimetres squared of space each, of which only 600 centimetres squared must be usable. And that's barely the space of an A4 sheet of paper. Um, and I will um, reintroduce a, a, an anecdote I told in the Bill Committee, which you were not able to enjoy, Mr Davis, which is that um, many years ago um, I was the, the welcome recipient of a rescue chicken that fell off a lorry um, near, nearby. And Trevor the chicken was a great joy to me, but that transformation from the caged bird to a bird that could display um, very quickly, it's astonishing how powerful nature is, all the, the, the natural characteristics and behaviours um, was very telling for me. And uh, I think it, it, it underpins many of our, our people's concern for welfare. But it's not just, of course, egg-laying hens. Um, we still have the farrowing crates that uh, honourable members have already referred to to cage 60% of our pigs. And while the sale stalls, which keep pigs caged for the entirety of their pregnancy, were rightly banned back in 1999, sows can still be caged in this way, as we've heard, for up to five weeks at a time prior to birth and during the weaning of piglets in farrowing crates, during which time the sow is quite often completely unable to turn around, can scarcely take a step forward or backward, and cannot reach the piglets that are placed next to her for suckling. And the scientific evidence that sow welfare is severely compromised has been well established for many years, and we now know that keeping the pigs caged in this way leads to bar biting, prevents pigs carrying out natural behaviours, as we've heard, such as nesting, and can lead to higher stress hormone levels, longer farrowing durations and higher still birth rates. Now, we understand the arguments um, from the industry about the need to prevent the death of piglets by accidental crushing, but I think the arguments are shifting and looking at the evidence, it does seem there's plenty of robust research and combined studies to, to date show little significant difference in mortality of piglets in crated, in crated versus loose house systems. So the alternatives are there, has been explained, I think we're moving in that direction. I fear the real issue is one of economics and costs at the moment, and that is the kind of issue that I think um, can be addressed. Now, we've also heard about the issues surrounding calf pens, and while veal crates are banned, young calves are still able to be kept in solitary, solitary caged hutches for the first eight weeks of their lives as soon as they've been taken away from the mother cow. The logic is said to be that young calves are highly susceptible to disease, but we also know that cattle are very social animals, and there is much evidence that calves are more stressed and fearful when caged individually in this way so soon after birth. And research shows that housing calves in pairs before weaning leads to a number of positive outcomes without compromising health or production, which, while fulfilling their need for social contact, also apparently can lead to increased weight gain compared with those housed alone. Now, as we've also heard, it's not just about um, animals farmed for food that are still kept in cages. We know that around 50 million pheasants and partridges are mass-produced in the UK to be shot, with large numbers of breeding birds confined for most of their lives in so-called raised laying cages that are left outside, exposed to the elements and extremes of temperature. As we've heard, uh, regulation is limited to a code of practice for the welfare of game birds reared for sporting purposes under the Animal Welfare Act which recommends that entirely barren cages are not used. But as we've also heard, this, case, this code is not legally binding, and I fear it is too often flouted. So, Mr Davis, Labour believes that we must put an end to the use of cages on our farms and in our production systems. And the strength of numbers it, behind this petition demonstrates just how popular um, that would be. And I was struck looking at the numbers behind the petition, because sometimes you see extreme numbers in some places and smaller numbers elsewhere. This is very well spread across much of the country. I think it is, a, it is something which um, the British people would universally welcome. And it's because of these welfare concerns and consumer demand for better welfare products that, as we've also heard, uh, the main UK supermarkets have already made moves on this. As we've heard, Morrison's have done so. Tesco's unilaterally re introduced a requirement in 2018 that all dairy calves on their supplier farms be reared in pairs or groups. And the use of farrowing crates has also be, been identified by the British Veterinary Association as one of seven priority animal welfare problems relating to pigs. And the Soil Association and RSPCA already both prohibit the use of farrowing crates under their labels. 
Now, we've had this debate already about um, um, how we move forward, but what's missing here, in our view, is considered that government action to step in and introduce measures to end the use of these cage systems on our farms once and for all. Because we believe that simply leaving the burden of responsibility on individual consumers to make this change is problematic. Because for so many people, price is still the key driver. And we entirely understand that. It's not uh, in any way condemning people who are forced to make choices because they're on limited incomes. Even if they would like to support higher standards, they can't afford to do so. Now, we had this discussion in some depth during the bill proceedings on the Agriculture Committee. Um, our view is that we've got to make it easier for people to make the right choice by actually excluding the low-cost, low-welfare alternatives. And there's clear evidence that standards are lifted, industries respond, and prices begin to settle. This is a case of needing clear leadership. Again, as has already been said, we pride ourselves in our country in leading on higher animal welfare standards, but sadly other countries are moving ahead of us on this. Luxembourg has already banned enriched cage colony systems for egg-laying hens, and Germany and Austria are phasing them out. Norway, Sweden and Switzerland have already banned sow farrowing, farrowing crates, and free farrowing systems are being developed in other European countries, particularly Denmark and the, and the Netherlands. Now, we recognise, Mr Davis, that such bans would need to be phased in with proper safeguards in place to support the industry in transition. We saw back in 1999, when sow stalls were rightly banned by the Labour government, this did have an impact, clearly, on the domestic pig industry. And I acknowledge that. So it's vital that government help is there to support a switch to alternative systems. And it's also vital, and this is a recurring theme, of course, that we ensure that any home production of animal products produce these higher welfare, cage-free standards aren't simply undercut and replaced by imports produced in other countries still using lower welfare cage systems. And of course this should be one of the benefits of our newfound freedoms to take back control. So I'd encourage the government to do it. That's why it's so important for the government to put it into law. Their promise is that upcoming trade deals won't simply sell out our farmers by allowing lower standard imports. And the fact is the government knows this is the right direction to travel which is why we've been hearing some quite positive noises, because both the previous Environment Secretary and the current Minister for Farming have said the government's aim is for farrowing crates to no longer be necessary. And in the government's belatedly released Future of Farming document, one of my favourite documents, <laughs> laying out their plans for British farming post-Brexit, the government has said they want to establish an animal health and welfare pathway in partnership with farmers and stakeholders, looking at improving animal welfare and health, including in relation to confinement, but we feel this is all too vague. The government's new agriculture bill, which will soon be having its report stage, we hope, is the perfect place to introduce measures for supporting farmers in ending the use of cages. But sad to say, the government have rejected every one of our helpful amendments to the bill so far aimed at better promoting farm animal welfare and enabling the ending of cages and intensive farming practices. They've rejected amendments that would establish a stronger baseline for animal welfare regulation across the board and amendments that would ensure that those receiving public money for improving animal welfare are going above and beyond this baseline, as the Honourable Member for Bristol East so eloquently explained earlier. They've also rejected amendments to promote the conduct of research into the impact of highly intensive livestock farming practices on animal welfare. And they've rejected amendments to give the Secretary of State the power to introduce a phase ban on sow farrowing crates and to explicitly allow farmers to receive public money for phasing out sow farrowing crates. So in conclusion, Mr Davis, what we need from this debate are some rock-solid commitments that ending the use of cages on our farms is a true priority for the government and proper detail on how the government plans to achieve this in its farming policy moving forward. The government have stated on numerous occasions the aspiration that the UK will become the global leader in farm animal welfare once we leave the EU. And if the government were really serious about this ambition, it could embrace a cage-free future now. And I challenge the Minister to explain why the suffering should be allowed to continue, why we think we should, be, we should end the cage age one day, I'm going to do that one again, why she thinks we should end the cage age one day, but not yet. Thank you so much for that, and particularly the story of the liberation of Trevor. I assume oh. Trevor wasn't an egg-laying chicken. Um, now, may I say from the chair, just briefly, if I could say to 
Patricia Gibson. I noticed uh, Stephen Bonner, who made a contribution, has left before listening to the wind up. I'd be very grateful if you just have a quick word that's not convention. Uh, uh, it's a small point of uh, procedure. And then finally, then, to complete the hen party, can I invite the Minister <laughs> Victoria Prentice? <laughs> I think I will call you, Mr. Chairman. I, I don't think I'll call you anything else in the circumstances. I would genuinely like to thank the Petitions Committee for giving us the opportunity today to discuss this very important subject. And it is a pleasure to follow excellent speeches from all sides of the House, particularly, of course, my honourable friend from Southend, who I have heard speak passionately on these issues many times. And indeed, we rehearsed many of these arguments um, in the Agriculture Bill Committee when um, the honourable gentleman was chairing, so he was silenced from opining on the subject, but it's good, particularly good, therefore, to hear from him today. I would also like to thank everybody who signed the petition, over 100,000 people, and for, for bringing this to our attention, and to acknowledge and praise, indeed, the animal welfare campaigners over the years who have played an enormous part with celebrity endorsement, with advertising, with general encouragement um, to improve our animal welfare standards over the years. We, we've come a long way, particularly in the welfare standards of, of chickens like Trevor. The government has been clear that it places great importance on the welfare of farmed animals. The End the Cage Age petition calls for a ban on the use of barren and enriched cages for farmed animals. And I would like to assure everybody here that this is an issue which the government is keen to explore. Indeed, the Prime Minister noted in Parliament last year that there were animal welfare measures that he was keen to bring forward. We will continue to focus on main <coughs> maintaining world-leading farm animal welfare standards through both regulatory requirements and statutory codes. The welfare of our farmed livestock is protected by comprehensive and robust legislation backed up by these statutory species-specific welfare codes. These codes encourage high standards of husbandry and keepers are required by law to have access to them and be familiar with them. As part of these welfare reforms, I'm pleased to say that the third of our new updated welfare codes came into force on the 1st of March for pigs, and I will say a little bit more about that later. The government has set itself a challenging agenda of animal welfare issues that we will tackle and we're taking action on many fronts to improve the health and well-being of farm animals. One major example is that we're committed to ex ending excessively long journeys for live animals going for slaughter and fattening. We are a very soon about to launch a consultation on how we deliver on that manifesto commitment and I'm keen to press ahead with that as soon as we can. Our Farming for the Future policy statement, which is the Honourable Gentleman's favourite reading, published last month, reiterates that in line with our national values, we wish to continue improving and building on our position, as you'd expect. And as part of our reforms to agricultural policy, we're developing publicly funded schemes for English farmers to provide public goods, including animal welfare enhancements, which are valued by the public and not sufficiently provided by the market. These enhancements could relate to improving animal welfare in relation to the use of cages and crates. And while not all of the examples I'm about to read are absolutely relevant to this debate, I think because this is a matter which the Honourable Gentleman and Lady Opposite and I have discussed many times now, it's important that I, I bring you in to our thinking as, as we go on. So we intend to develop publicly funded schemes to support farmers in England for delivering enhanced animal health and welfare. So these schemes are intended to reward them for going above and beyond already high standards, which I think the Honourable Lady has recognised. So taking broiler chickens as a specific example, delivering enhancements may include farms using slower growing, high welfare breeds of chicken that have the freedom to exhibit natural behaviours either through increased speech and a stimulating environment or the freedom to roam, peck and scratch outside. For dairy cattle, the enhanced freedom to exhibit natural behaviours could involve increased access to stimulating, stimulating loafing or outdoor space and the freedom to access and graze good quality pasture. 
Welfare enhancement for pigs I'll come on to later, but they could well include rooting and foraging, as well as ad addressing the issues of crates and tail dockings, of course. Well, I'm, I'm assuming these would be delivered through environmental land management schemes. And my question would be, would, this, would the, the, the measures she's describing be through the Tier 1 system? As the Honourable Gentleman knows, the system is currently being devised. I'm very keen to include him as much as I possibly can in the way that we do that. Some of it might well be Tier 1 funding, some may be Tier 2, and some may even, I, though I doubt it, be Tier 3. But I wouldn't want to rule anything out at this point. I think it's really important that we keep an open mind, that we look at how the tests and trials are going, and then we look at how the scheme is developed through the pilots. And um, the point I'm trying to make today is that it is, it is certainly intended that um, public goods include animal welfare, um, and that we can all think in, in, in this room at the moment of many improvements that we might like to see. We might want, for example, to look at animal health improvements, such as reduced lameness in cattle or sheep and lower levels of antimicrobial resistance. We will focus on welfare enhancements that deliver the greatest impact and benefit based, on, of course, on scientific evidence. I don't want to stray too far from the confines of this debate, but I think it's helpful to continue to have these conversations as the system is devolved. Going back to cages, I want to emphasise that cages are not used in England to keep some of the farmed animals referred to in the petition, namely farmed rabbits, broiler chicken breeders, layer breeders or guinea fowl. In 1990, as has been said, the UK unilaterally banned veal crates 16 years before the rest of the EU, though they did catch up in the end. Conventional battery cages for laying hens were banned here in 2012. I'm pleased to say that the UK already has a much larger free-range sector by far than any other EU country. And free-range sales represent about 67% of retail egg sales, not necessarily eggs incorporated in food in the UK. The government's currently examining the future use of cages for all laying hens. And I welcome the commitment from our major retailers, with positive support from our egg producers, to stop retailing eggs from enriched colony cage production systems by 2025. And I was interested to hear what the Honourable Lady had to say about Morrisons. And we obviously welcome that they have gone further. The government's also considering the use of cages for game birds, in including the systems used for breeding pheasants and partridges. The Honourable Gentleman outlined um, how these are governed by the Animal Welfare Act and the Code of Pro Practice, which follows from it, which provides keepers with guidance. The Act and DEFRA's Code are enforced by the Animal Plant Health Agency. In relation to pigs, now the Honourable Gentleman mentioned farmers being big softies, and I should probably confess at this point that I have kept pigs in the past, and... Uh, and they are one of my favourite animals, if, if a minister is allowed to have favourite animals. My pigs were extremely free-range, to the extent to which they sometimes caused a nuisance in the village. Um, <laughs> the Agriculture Bill Committee heard a certain amount about that. Um, in relation to pigs, the UK has led the way on improving their welfare, banning the keeping of sows, as we heard, in close confinement stalls in 1999. I am not in any way criticising that decision, but it is worth noting, as indeed the Honourable Gentleman did, that while in 1998 we were about 80% sufficient in pig meat, by 2003 that had fallen to about 50% and it's currently about 56%. What I am extremely keen not to do is to outsource animal welfare issues to other countries. The government has been clear and remains completely committed to the ambition that farrow and crates should no longer be used for sows. Indeed, the new pig welfare code, which I mentioned earlier, clearly states, and I quote, the aim is for farrow and crates no longer to be necessary and for any new system to protect the welfare of the sow as well as her piglets. It's important that we make progress towards a system which both works commercially and safeguards the welfare of the sow and the piglets, and that we do so as quickly as possible. The UK is already ahead of most pig-producing countries in terms of this, with about 40% of our pigs um, living and farrowing outside. So there's 
good progress, but there is more to do. DEFRA has funded, as the Honourable Lady said, research into alternative farrowing systems. However, as yet, the commercial development of farrowing systems and practices is not sufficiently advanced to recommend the compulsory replacement of all far farrowing crates. But I'm very keen to work with the industry with carrots and sticks on this, because it is important um, not simply to move production abroad. In closing, I would like to thank the Honourable Member for Bristol East for securing today's debate. The Government places great importance on the welfare of all our animals. The measures I've set out today clearly demonstrate the steps the Government has already taken and continues to take to strengthen our high animal welfare standards. We're exploring, actively exploring the options around the use of cages and we'll work with industry to improve animal welfare in a sustainable way and I think the Agriculture Bill and its provisions will help us to do so. Thank you so much. Uh, Carrie McCarthy to wind up. Thank you. Um, I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone who took part in this debate. It was, as the Shadow Minister said, um, poor timing in that it did the start of the debate at six o'clock did coincide with the start of the latest statement in the Commons on um, COVID-19. And um, I appreciate that some of the petitioners may be slightly disappointed that for that reason it didn't have as good a turnout as the, the last debate on animal sentience. But I'd like to assure that that doesn't mean that um, MPs are not paying attention to what's in their email inbox and, and don't care about these issues and definitely want to see improvements. Again, I, I appreciate that DEFRA has an awful lot on its plate at the moment, um, as do all government departments, but EFRA is particularly uh, overwhelmed with legislation. Having not had legislation or significant legislation for quite some time, um, suddenly it's, um, it's got three major bills and some smaller ones kicking around as well. But I, I just would impress upon the Minister that there are many, many people out there that would like to see higher animal welfare standards. I hope that this is something that we can um, use the mixture of the carrot and stick that has been spoken about. So it's partly about rewarding farmers through the Agriculture Bill, but also I'm all in favour of banning things once we've decided that they are ethically unacceptable and once there are alternatives in place, which I would argue is the, the case for um, uh, the, the farrowing crates in particular. Um, but I'm sure we will revisit this issue and, um, yes, uh, I don't know whether it's my job to say thank you or to come. And I thank the chair for coming because I know he had some reservations about turning up today and uh, it shows great pluck of him to um, actually come along. I'm a free pig. Um, the question is that this House has considered e-petition 243448 relating to the caging of farm animals. As many as of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order. Thank you so much. In animal farm. <laughs>